Uh, this is sort of exciting because this is, this is a first for this building. We haven't had this kind of presentation before. So, Duncan, you're, you're kind of an experiment here. And so we're, we're figuring out the acoustics and we're figuring out the light and the uh, engagement with the group formerly known as the audience. So um, I'm going to carry on in that uh, spirit of experimentation. Um, but I do want to really thank everyone for attending today. This is um, uh, the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. This building was designed for exactly this kind of event, to bring people together, to share ideas, um, to share their experience. And this is an especially important one uh, today. Uh, this is for the Ev Rogers Award, about which you will hear more in a moment. Um, but I do want you to take advantage of this building, co continue to come to great programs like this one, Feel free to take a tour of the, uh, of the building as well. Uh, it goes up four or five floors. Uh, and it is really designed to create rooms, as we call it, that are not containers, but are connectors. And so this, again, is a perfect event because this is an event that connects people together in the spirit of, uh, of Ed Rogers, who was one of our professors here. Uh, I'm delighted now to introduce uh, the director of the Norman Lear Center, uh, who has a long distinguished career across multiple institutions and sectors of the American economy, working in politics and entertainment and the academy. Your PhD is in some, what, American studies, what is it? Modern thought and literature. Um, and he has worked, again, in, in any number of fields with his great team over at the Lear Center. So without further ado, let me int uh, introduce my good friend and schoolmate um, and general public intellectual. You're on the front page of the New York Times today, is that right? A small accomplishment for uh, another accomplishment for, uh, for Marty Kaplan. So without further ado, Marty Kaplan. Thank you. And you'll be hearing very little from me, so relax. Um, as you can see, the hashtag is Duncan Watts, and so please feel free to, to live tweet. I always want, at the beginning rather than the end of an event, to thank the people who made this possible. That This is a whole year enterprise. There is a jury, there's uh, all kinds of award meetings, and uh, there are jurors here today from across the university and elsewhere in the country. There are uh, amazingly dedicated staff people, uh, both here at the Annenberg School and at the Lear Center. I'm just going to single out one who is uh, the key person for events for us, Veronica Howdicke, who's right there. Thank you so much. So today is the uh, presentation of the F. Rogers Award. And to explain what the Rogers Award is, I'd like to introduce to you my colleague on the Annenberg faculty who also chaired the jury that made this selection, Professor Peter Clark. Thank you, Marty. And thank you, Dean Wilson. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, my co-committee and juror members, um, Leo Brody, uh, Casey Cole, uh, Doe Mayer, a Nosh Contractor, who's here today from uh, Northwestern, uh, Arvin Singal, uh, Tom Valenti, uh, and uh, also uh, Marty and uh, Dean Wilson, who serve uh, as an ex officio, in an ex officio role on the committee. Uh, we've been giving this award now for about uh, almost 10 years. And I want to tell you just a little bit about Ev Rogers. Uh, he was born on a farm near Carroll, Iowa in 1931. He died in 2004. Uh, he was on the Annenberg School faculty uh, from uh, 1985 to 1993. Uh, in his career, uh, he was uh, one of the most cited individuals in all of the social sciences. 
but he was particularly uh, famous and revered for his work on the diffusion of innovations, uh, a book that went through multiple editions. Um, he was, for a while, considered the world authority on the diffusion of innovations. But that was not Ev's only intellectual specialization. Uh, and that tells you a little bit about this award. He, he was uh, really a founder of the entertainment education movement and certainly of uh, empirical research on entertainment education processes. Uh, but that wasn't enough. He was also a pioneer in the study of uh, communication and national development. Uh, he conducted primary uh, data gathering in many locations in Asia, in Africa, uh, in Latin and South America. Uh, he was um, uh, an authority on uh, networks and social networks. He wrote in the history of, the, of communication as a field. Um, many, many different specialties. In his career, he uh, wrote or, or edited uh, 32 books, uh, more than 400 uh, refereed journal articles. In short, he left behind a very rich intellectual legacy. Uh, Ev was also um, uh, devoted to his students. And so it is uh, very fitting that several of his former students now sit on the jury that uh, makes each year the Ev Rogers Award uh, selection, which is meant uh, year by year to celebrate different facets uh, of Ev Rogers' career. Uh, so it's a great, with a great sense of pride and, and satisfaction uh, that I approach this day each year. Uh, and have the chance to tell you about a, a dear colleague of mine who I counted also as a great personal friend. That's a snowy tree cricket. And though it is not the one named Odysseus, Prometheus, or Hercules, uh, it was uh, crickets that Duncan Watts was studying as a graduate student at Cornell at a decisive moment in his career. I want to tell you very briefly about some of the places that he's been, uh, which you may know from our flyers. Um, he was a graduate student at Cornell, and there uh, he ended up studying what became a field. Uh, his first paper, Collective Dynamics of Small World Networks, was published in Nature, and it has been cited 23,000 times, which is one of the most cited papers in any field in the last couple of decades. Um, after Cornell, he went to Columbia and was a professor of sociology, moving from physics to sociology. Uh, and uh, from there, he went to Yahoo Research and then where he is currently, uh, Microsoft Research, which is in New York. Uh, there are some things that, as I said, you might not see on his official biography, and they include that something I love, that paper that I just mentioned, was something, the re he did the research as a graduate student. So one of the most cited papers in any field was the result of work done as a graduate student. Uh, he has done a lot of work in uh, an area that people sometimes summarize as the six degrees of separation thing. And the way that enters into his work is that his father casually mentioned this on a phone call with him when his father was in Australia. It combined with a bunch of other stuff and it seems like a light bulb uh, went off. I also love the fact that he writes trade books 
as well as academic books, and he writes for publications that the public reads in addition to writing for academic journals. And so he has taken uh, the public intellectual route at the same time as he is also in industry and also uh, working on academic research. And then uh, finally, uh, you may not know that uh, the website Gothamist called him a certified hunk. To present the Ev Rogers Award to Duncan and for you to hear from him, I'd just like Ernie and Peter to come back up and uh, Duncan, if you wouldn't mind coming up and you guys would be photogenic. You want to give him the plaque? I'll give him the money? You give him the money, I'll give him the plaque. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Cash, <laughs> a check, I guess I have, okay, we're on chat, yeah. okay, so <laughs> thanks. And Peter, you did the important thing. Okay, congratulations. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Marty, for the generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Peter and Dean Wilson. Thank you to the jurors for, uh, for selecting me. This is a great honor, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, so uh, I'm, I, I'm really, I'm not really sure what, I wasn't really sure what kind of presentation to give on such an occasion, so uh, I'm really just going to, to talk about research. I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing, uh, not the work that, that Marty mentioned, that uh, was done a long time ago, uh, but more uh, recent work that I think is uh, at least uh, in, uh, in part of the tradition of, of, of Ev Rogers' work. So. Uh, I want to talk today about, um, about adoption and about the, uh, the relationship between adoption and contagion and models of contagion and how things spread and, and get into sort of more contemporary notions of what we mean uh, when we talk about things going viral uh, and spreading virally online. Uh, and so uh, clearly this is a topic that has been around for a long time. Everett Rogers uh, worked on this uh, many years ago and even before that uh, there was uh, a lot of work in, in rural sociology uh, where people were trying to understand uh, how things uh, succeed. And in particular uh, we would like to know the attributes of, of which things succeed versus the many, many things that do not succeed. And when things, that would be great, yeah. And when things when things do succeed, we'd like to know how they succeed. So this is really the dynamics of success is, is what, uh, R what Rogers is most famous for working on. And so once you start thinking about adoption, like why people do things, why people uh, take on new ideas or new behaviors or, or, or adopt new products, uh, it's a very short step from that to thinking about contagion. That it's very clear in our own lives and we look at other people and when we read about it, uh, that p people do not make decisions about these things independently, but we are always uh, concerned with what other people are doing. And sometimes we're concerned with that because we learn from them. People know things that we don't know, and so when they're doing something, that is in some sense a vote of confidence in that particular uh, product or behavior. Uh, or sometimes we're interested in coordinating with them. If you think about a lot of cultural consumption, uh, the kinds of shows that you watch on TV or the movies that you go to see or the books that you read, Part of the enjoyment you get from that is intrinsic and individual, but part of it is also social, that you get to share the experience of having watched something or knowing about something with other people. And so for both of these reasons, uh, there are very strong motivations to, uh, to do the same thing that other people are doing. And so once you get that idea, you, you can see how you can think about this process uh, in, in analogous to how a disease might spread between people as well. There's some sort of contact, there's some kind of transmission, uh, and then a new person uh, has the thing as well. So this metaphor of a disease spreading uh, uh, relating to crowd behavior and adoption has actually been around for a long, long time, much longer even than, than Everett Rogers, going back to the 19th century where people like Charles McKay wrote about mob behavior and crowd behavior and fads and financial crises, uh, very much with this metaphor of, of disease spreading in mind. And then uh, in the 20th century, uh, this metaphor got turned into mathematics. And so there was a, a body of work in the 1920s, uh, uh, like uh, with Kermack and McKendrick, who, 
who uh, formalized the early mathematical models of disease spreading, and then those models were kind of picked up uh, and, and, and repurposed by social scientists uh, to, uh, to, to, to understand the process by which, uh, by which ideas and, and, and uh, social behaviors also can spread. And I'm not going to go into the details of these models. There are, uh, there are many, many such models. Um, but all of them have a common uh, 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 sort of frame of thinking or a common metaphor or a common uh, mo mental model of how the world works. And it really looks something like this. When we, when we think about social diffusion or contagion, we have this kind of picture in our minds. And when we think about it, for example, if we think about what's going on with Ebola in Africa right now, this is exactly what's happening, that there's some uh, individual there in the center who's patient zero, who is the first person to get infected, uh, usually from some animal vector. Uh, and then they uh, infect a few of their uh, family members or, or close neighbors, and then those people infect a few of their uh, family members or close neighbors, and then maybe a few steps later you see health care workers getting infected. But at every step of the way, there's only, each person is only infecting a few other people, but because this process can grow exponentially like a, like a, like a branching process, uh, it, many, many people can get infected over uh, some extended period of time. So when we think about things going viral, either actual biological viruses or, or uh, no, viral videos or, 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 uh, or fads or uh, successful products, we have in mind that, 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 these, uh, that, that, that the underlying process is some multi-step branching process that grows from something very small to something very large, and sometimes it can do so quite rapidly. So just bear that mental model in mind uh, for the rest of the talk, because when we measure diffusion, when we measure adoption, we often don't have that kind of data, that historically, uh, the kind of data that we have had to, to, to uh, uh, test our models on is this aggregate level data. So this is uh, data where in both of these cases the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the total number of people in a population uh, who have adopted the product. On the left hand side is this famous paper by Coleman, Katz and Menzel looking at the diffusion of tetracycline in, uh, among doctors in the Midwest. Uh, and the right-hand side is from the, the Frank Bass paper in the 1960s where he was looking at the diffusion of, of, uh, of new uh, consumer products. And the left-hand side is a cumulative plot, so you're seeing the cumulative number of adopters, and the right-hand side is, is an instantaneous plot. But the, both of these, uh, or this style of data has a couple of very serious problems when it comes to uh, adoption, uh, d t testing models of diffusion. The first is that these, the, the, the sorts of uh, S-shaped diffusion curves that we get out of, uh, uh, out of diffusion models uh, can arise in very different ways, right? So if we think about this, so the right-hand, the little motif there is the, the famous Rogers plot of, of, of the, the population distributed according to their propensity to, uh, to adopt a new innovation. If you just think of that propensity as being something that varies over time, that some people are just are, are prone to, uh, to adopt something early when they first hear about it and other people take longer, you can actually get a, uh, a, an S-shaped diffusion curve over time without any kind of social influence at all, right? So there's, it, you, you, there, there are other ways, just, just by assuming some kind of heterogeneity throughout the population, you can generate something that looks like the plots we saw on the previous slide without any kind of uh, underlying diffusion process happening. Uh, other work has shown that you can also get these kinds of curves by, by uh, allowing for marketing efforts. And so just because you see an S-shaped curve in your data doesn't mean that you have seen any kind of diffusion. The other kind of problem with these S-shaped curves, the, these aggregate level uh, adoption curves that we, that we have, is that we only tend to collect them for things that are successful, right? That we only study the things that diffuse. And you might say, well, why would you study things that don't diffuse? Why would you, you know, if you care about success, why would you study not success? Uh, but actually there's a very good reason to study not success, and it's because if you want to 
uh, develop causal explanations, if you want to make predictions, you have to study both the thing and not the thing, right? If you only go and look at successful people and then write down a list of what successful people do, you know, you might find that they all get up and eat breakfast in the morning, right? And you might think, ah, that's a, that's a sign of a successful person. But of course, all the unsuccessful people also get up and eat breakfast in the morning. So it turns out that that's not a very predictive feature uh, of success. And if, if what we do as social scientists is only study the interesting things, uh, as sensible as that sounds, we're falling for the, the, uh, the old uh, fallacy of selection on the dependent variable. We really need to get a sample of everything that might possibly diffuse in order to understand why some things diffuse and others don't. And so if we want to really understand the models and if we really want to understand the world, we have to have data that uh, is measured at an individual level where we can see, you know, person I I got something from person J and then they passed it on to person K. We want to be able to do this at scale and we want to be able to do this for every single thing that's trying to diffuse, right? So this seems like a very uh, high uh, burden uh, to place on your data collection and indeed it is, but in the last several years we've been able to start getting exactly this type of data from the web and, you know, there are all kinds of problems and limitations of relying on online data, and we can talk about those later. But for the first time really in history, we're starting to get this type of data. Uh, and you can see that the earliest citation that I have there is from 2005 by Lada Adamic and Eitan Adar. And so this is very, very recent in our, in our history that, that we have been able to, to study data of this particular scale and form. And so now that we have data like this, we can start to ask different sorts of questions. So we can ask when we see diffusion, is it really viral diffusion or is something else going on? What do we even really mean by viral? Uh, and secondly, uh, when we do see viral diffusion, like what does it look like? What does it actually look like, right, literally? Okay, so I wanna talk about a couple of different projects that my collaborators and I have worked on over the last few years where we've tried to sort of dig around at these, uh, these very simple questions and the first is, uh, is work that was done with uh, Sharad Goyle and Dan Goldstein back when we were at Yahoo Research. Uh, and we took uh, several different projects that we had all, uh, e either we had worked on or that our colleagues had worked on. And all of these projects were motivated by other research questions, right? So uh, there was a, 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 a project that, and you see in the top left hand corner where we helped the, the Yahoo uh, philanthropic arm um, uh, build a, a holiday campaign around a, a pay it forward style of giving. So you would do something nice for somebody else and then you would tweet about it or, or post a status update online and then you would exhort your friends and followers to do something nice for somebody else and then they would do that and then they would post something online. And so you could develop what was called ripples of kindness. Uh, so you can see that these are, there was an intent there to, to generate social diffusion of kindness through these large social networks. We also looked at a, a Facebook app where, uh, called FriendSense where we were measuring uh, uh, individuals' political beliefs and their friends' political beliefs and also their beliefs about their friends' political beliefs. You wanted to, to, uh, to understand whether people think they're more similar to their friends than they really are. As part of building that app, we built in a social recruitment mechanism. And so even though this was a, a, a study of, of, of political homophily, we had a diffusion project built into this uh, experimental design. And so this is true for all of the examples that we looked at, and I don't wanna go through them in detail. The point is that they were all very different types of projects. So if you pick any one of these things, you might say, well, you did this app on Facebook. Facebook's kind of a strange social network. There's all kinds of selection biases. This was back in 2008 when Facebook was much smaller. Um, you know, there's nothing you can really say about the world in general based on this one example. And that same objection or similar objections would be, uh, could be uh, uh, made about any of the six projects that we looked at. But the key here is that the biases associated with each of these, uh, of these projects is very different. Different scales, different types of networks, different adoption processes, different selection biases. So uh, they're all biased, but they're all biased in different ways. And so if we see consistent patterns across them, there's some hope that those patterns are robust, okay? So with that in mind, 
we see tremendous consistency across uh, these uh, uh, across these these examples. And so, if um, I think this laser pointer is underpowered for the screen, so it is actually working, but you can't see it up there. So. Um, so, okay, so there's six examples there. They're all labeled where, by where they came from. In each case, what I'm showing you is the, the five most common motifs. So a motif is, a, is an event, a diffusion event that has some structure to it. So if we look at the Twitter example on the top right-hand side, this is several tens of millions of, of, uh, of uh, shortened URLs, bitly URLs that were introduced into Twitter over a two-month period. And the little dot there that has 93% under it, what that means is that 93% of the time somebody has introduced a piece of information into Twitter and nothing else has happened, right? So this may reflect some of your own experience with Twitter uh, where you talk and nobody listens. Um, so that, you're in good company, 93% of the time nobody listens. 5% uh, of the time you can see there's a, a little dyad there, that means that one of your followers has retweeted your tweet. Uh, 0.9% of the time, two of your followers retweet your tweet. 0.3% of the time, three of them, you get three retweets. And then 0.3% of the time, one of your followers retweets it and one of their followers retweets it. So you get a little bit of what you might think of as legitimate contagion. So that's how you interpret these uh, motifs. So every dot represents an adoption and a link uh, represents the, a, a parent child Care. And so there's a couple of, of, of points to note about this figure. One is that there's six different examples and there's five slots for each one of them. So there's 30 possible motifs that we might see. We only actually see seven, right? So there's tremendous consistency across these very, very different examples. Uh, and in fact, in many cases, even the actual frequencies are pretty similar, right? So there's a lot of consistency uh, across them. The second thing to note is that the vast bulk of everything that's happening is accounted for by the little motifs that you see on this slide. And to make that even more clear, we can summarize even further um, uh, by aggregating everything together. So now this is all the data together. And you can see that about, on average, across all these different examples, 90% of the time, zero adoptions happen, or one adoption happens, but that adoption is you, you're the seed. Uh, about 8% of the time, uh, you see one additional adoption. About 1% of the time, you see two additional adoptions from your, from your immediate followers. And then 1% of the time is everything else. So everything you've heard of, you know, Gangnam Style, Call Me Maybe, the 11-year-old doing the dance act this week. Uh, uh, these crazy viral things that get in the media and attract all our attention, they're all in that little blue bar on the right-hand side there, right? So the vast major majority of everything is, is nothing happening, and the vast majority of something happening is not very much happening. So we call this the buzzkill law of social media because there are many people in the, you know, often in the, the marketing world who are very excited about, you know, anytime something goes viral, they go see their, their agency and they say, you know, I want that. Um, can you make that happen for my message or my product? Uh, and the answer is that most of the time you cannot, okay? So we can actually make an even stronger statement. You might say, well, that's fair enough. We know that big things are rare. Ebola is also, you know, epidemics of Ebola are also rare. But when they happen, they're a really big deal, right? And so we really, uh, you know, even if they're infrequent, many uh, of the infections that happen, happen in the biggest events. So if we think about influenza, it's probably the case that over the entire history of humans getting the flu, many of them, a large fraction of them, got the flu in a single event, which was about 100 years ago during what was called the Spanish flu uh, epidemic. And about a billion people, a third of the planet at that time, got infected by this particular strain of influenza. So even though that event is super rare, the a number of adoptions or infections uh, that happened in that event was so large that it was a significant fraction of all infections ever. We do not see that here, right? We see something quite different, and that's the second line here, which is a much stronger statement than the first line. 
Uh, and that is that if we look at all adoptions, wherever they happen, near the seed, far from the seed, everywhere at all, we add them all up and we ask, where were they in relation to the seed? 99% of them were right here next to the seed itself. So there's, if you think of viral spread as being something that's many steps away from where it entered the population, then only 1% of all adoptions uh, uh, could be called viral in that sense, right? Or another way to put it is if you had a really, really stupid model of contagion that just said, I only believe that three things happen. It's that, that, or that and they happen in precisely those frequencies, and that's my model of the world, you would account for 99% of everything that happens. Okay, so that's a pretty good model in terms of accounting for your data. So as someone who has spent you know, a good chunk of my career writing down mathematical models of diffusion, this was a little bit of a disappointing result at first, because um, you know, what the hell are we doing? And so you might have the reaction that, you know, okay, but I know this happens, right? And you know, Please tell me that everybody knows what this is. <laughs> so uh, about a billion people have watched this video. Um, if somebody can explain to me why, uh, I would be very interested to hear. Um, but it's, it's funny, it's interesting, uh, and it's incredibly viral. Um, and so you might say, well, even if it's very rare, even if it only accounts for a small fraction of total video views, which is, is true, um, it's still very interesting and I still want to know why it happened. Uh, and so even there there's an interesting question, right? Because really all we, we, we talk about this video going viral, but really all we know is that it got a billion views. It was very popular, right? But you know, the Super Bowl is also very popular. Uh, you know, about 100 million people watch the Super Bowl. Nobody thinks that the Super Bowl is a viral phenomenon, right? It's a broadcast phenomenon, right? And so the same thing could be true of Gangnam Style, that you know, at some point in its evolution, it got picked up by Yahoo News and was on the front page of Yahoo News, and 100 million people a day go and look at Yahoo News. And so maybe they all just got it from Yahoo News. Right? So maybe uh, what we're really seeing when we think we're seeing viral spread is more like a broadcast. So that's what these uh, images on the right-hand side look, uh, are, are showing you, is that there's a an individual seed in the middle that's broadcasting something out and it has a large number of followers and they're all adopting it or retweeting it and then very little else is happening, right? But the number is big, right? The number is as big as what you see uh, in, the, in the viral spread. But the structure is completely different, right? So we would like to be able to differentiate between the structure of things that we might consider viral. And so this is uh, an, another project, also with Sherrod Goyle, but this time with Ashton Anderson uh, uh, at Stanford University, uh, and Jake Hoffman, another colleague of mine at, at, at Microsoft. Uh, and we, uh, we started this project sort of in response to one of the critiques that we got from the previous project, which was, well, you know, that's all very well and good, but really all you've shown us is that you didn't see anything interesting, right, that you collected... It looks like you collected a lot of data, but you just didn't collect enough, right? And so all the interesting stuff is sort of dark matter to your study. And so there's really no way to defeat that objection except to just get more data. And so that's what we did. And uh, we have the fire hose of, of Twitter at, uh, at Microsoft Research. Uh, and so we took 12 months of Twitter data, everything on Twitter, right? Uh, and then we look for every, uh, every piece of content that is associated with a news outlet or a, uh, or a video or an image or a petition. So to a rough approximation, we have every single news story, every single video, every single petition, every single image posted to Twitter for an entire year, right? This is well over a billion uh, observations. If something is going viral, we're going to see it, okay? Uh, but of course, much of that content might never have had any intention of going viral. Maybe people were just posting it and it was just for their family members. And so it's sort of a little bit unfair to treat everything as a potentially viral um, uh, uh, object. And so let's just restrict to the things that we know were that, that pass some threshold of popularity. So 
if we say, okay, we're, we're going to we take all our 1.4 billion observations and we restrict only to trees, so like, like those little motifs that I just showed you, but now we insist that they have at least 100 nodes in them, right? So they have to be pretty big diffusion events to even pass our threshold. And in fact, only about one in 3,000 events uh, meets this criteria, right? So we're already looking at super rare things, but because we have 1.4 billion things to start off with, we still have uh, about 350,000 observations that, that are now in our, in our popular thing data set. And then we crawl the active follower graph, which is about 65 million users. Okay. Um, and then, so now we have these 350,000 events, and for each of them, we can define what we call uh, a measure of structural virality. And so structural virality is designed to disambiguate precisely between those two pictures that I showed you on the previous slide, the, the branchy thing, the multi-generational branchy thing, and the big blob broadcast thing. Uh, and there's various ways you can do that, but a very straightforward one is to just to measure the average path length between any two pair of nodes. So you pick two pairs, two nodes at random, and you see how many steps in the tree does it take to get from one to the other. When it's a broadcast, that number is almost always two. So the, the minimal uh, value that, uh, that our measure of structural virality can have is two. And then when it's a branchy structure, it, it, it increases roughly with the log of the number of uh, nodes in the network. And so it can grow to an unbounded number. So it's bounded below by two, and then it, gets, uh, it can become arbitrarily large. Okay, so that's our notion of structural virality. Uh, and we want to look at... Um, uh, at all these large events that we see and ask, what are they? Are they broadcasts or are they viral in the, no the way that we, that we imagine viral? And so I want you to, uh, to think for a moment in the privacy of your own minds. I won't make anybody put their hands up, but I'd like you to make a sort of mental commitment, right? Uh, that when you think about the biggest things on Twitter, what are they? Are they, are they broadcasts? Are they sort of the Super Bowl? Or are they super viral? Right, are they things that spread and spread and spread? And then if you would like, I'll give you a third option because you probably think that I'm trying to trick you, um, which is maybe there's some optimal combination of the two, right? That there's some sort of magic uh, broadcast viral thing that, that works uh, in perfect harmony together to, to generate the, uh, the biggest uh, events. So everybody make their guess. Uh, and then the answer is that you're all right. Uh, and... But the reason why you're all right is because we see everything, right? Uh, so this picture shows six different uh, events that are ranked by our measure of structural virality from least structurally viral to most structurally viral on the bottom right. They're all the same size, right? So they all have about the same number of adoptions in them. But you can see that they vary tremendously in structure. So the one up on the top left is almost a pure broadcast. That big black triangle is just one node, probably CNN or something, CNN breaking news, like blasting out a story. It gets a lot of retweets from the people who follow CNN breaking news and then almost nothing else. Okay, down in the bottom right-hand corner, you see something that looks pretty viral, right? Many, many generations you know, there's probably 20 or 30 generations deep there, uh, and most of it is just individuals getting a few retweets at a time, right? And then there's a couple of, of sort of uh, larger broadcasts along the way, but it's pretty viral. So the first point to notice is that when we have this enormous sample of everything that's happening on Twitter, and we, if you had some sort of a priori theory about, you know, how this stuff is supposed to happen, your theory would be right, and your theory would also be wrong, right? That there would be, you know, uh, many things that it would not account for because we see this really puzzling diversity, right? And, it, and I, I say puzzling because we actually don't really know how to explain it. We have some ideas, but it's, it's not clear how you can get that much diversity. The other thing to note is that if you had the old style of, of information, so these little uh, inserts underneath show... Uh, the cumulative adoption curve with time, okay? Uh, and so if you look at those curves, they all look pretty similar, okay? In particular, the top left and the bottom right 
look extremely similar, right? There is almost no difference in the aggregate over time adoption of these two things, but they are spreading in very, very different ways. So, so this is sort of an argument for thinking about the structure of viral spreading because it introduces an entirely new dimension to the, the sort of our taxonomy of what is happening in the world. Uh, the other thing that you might ask is, well, you know, so those things are all about the same size. Now you might ask, well, what about for different sizes? How do things change as we get bigger and bigger? And here again, it's a little puzzling. If we look at pictures and videos, we see across, you know, two orders of magnitude from 100 to 10,000, basically no change, right, on average, right? For any given size, we see this diversity, right? These are box plots, so the, 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 the solid lines are the median, the box is the inner quartile range, and then the dots show everything that's outside all the outliers. So you do see a lot of diversity uh, for every uh, size range, but then over size ranges, you see almost no correlation at all between size and structural virality. And we think the reason is that what's driving the, 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 the size is the size of the biggest broadcast, right? So that uh, on Twitter, um, Twitter is very much not like a social network uh, in the sense that uh, the most followed people are many, many orders of magnitude uh, more popular. So it's, it's really very close to a scale-free network. So you know, Justin Bieber and Katy Perry have 50 million followers. I mean, this is really almost Super Bowl numbers, right? Uh, and so when they, when they post something, uh, it is much more likely to get thousands and thousands of retweets than, than if anybody else posts it, right? And if you look at the 100 most followed user accounts on Twitter, I think the only news organization in there is CNN Breaking News, right? Barack Obama is in there somewhere. Uh, everyone else is some celebrity, okay? And it turns out celebrities are not terribly interested in the news, right? They're very interested in pictures of themselves and of their friends, and they're very interested in videos. And so you can see that there's a lot, all the really big stuff is pictures and videos. Uh, the news, you see some correlation between size and structural virality. And again, it's not very high, but it's, it's some. And we think that that might be just because there aren't such big hubs in the news world, right? That it, it has to, for news stories to get big, they, they kind of have to get more generations of, of retweeting because there's no one who has, you know, the New York Times doesn't have as much power as, uh, as Justin Bieber, um, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, and petitions finally are, they're, they're, are an interesting case that there's, there's very little correlation, but they're sort of systematically more structurally viral than everything else. And again, we think this is because petitions really to spread, they have to get, uh, they, they, they can't really benefit from this broadcasting. Okay, so, so we can observe all this stuff. But of course, you know, we have this uh, desire and in some cases we have a business uh, objective to make predictions. We want to not just sort of uh, explain the world around us, but we want explanations that have predictive power because that, that they can be used. And, and we're very good at telling stories about the things that go viral. I'm sure that somebody in the audience actually does have an explanation for why Gangnam Style uh, was so viral, and it probably goes along the lines of, you know, all the things that make Gangnam Style Gangnam Style, right? That it was, you know, uh, and, and most explanations of success are of exactly this form, that the thing that succeeded succeeded because it's more like itself than everything else is. Um, uh, and so that's sort of the uniquely appealing attributes uh, argument, and we use that a lot. Uh, and then when you debunk that one, people say, well, okay, maybe it wasn't the, the thing itself, but it was the people who picked it up early on, it was the influencers, they were the ones who, um, uh, who, who made it spread. Uh, and so that is another kind of argument that people use. Uh, but for either of these st stories to actually be useful, they have to be predictive. And it's very, it is so much harder to make predictions than it is to explain things after the fact. We're very good at the latter, we're very, very bad at the former. Okay, so uh, I just want to tell you briefly about another project we're uh, actually sort of done before the other two, uh, with, uh, also with Jay Kaufman and uh, Winter Mason, uh, who was a colleague at Yahoo Research, and 
Eitan Bakshi, who was an intern with us back then and is now uh, at Facebook Data Science Team. Uh, and so we were trying to predict the size of the cascades given everything that we could measure, right? So everything about the, uh, the content itself and also the attributes of the people who introduced the content. And so this is a somewhat smaller study. Uh, we only had about 74 million cascades. Uh, uh, the average size was very consistent with the, the, the previous results. But here we're really trying to predict like how big these things are going to grow. Uh, and so we, did a, we took a subsample of them and we threw them up on Mechanical Turk and we got users to tell us like what kind of content it was because you might think you know, maybe you know, lifestyle things spread more than sporting stories. Um, and sure enough, it looks like there's some sort of uh, relationship there between the, the type of content and how uh, popular it is. Uh, we also asked them, how interesting do you think this is? You might think that interesting things spread more than uninteresting things. And again, there looks to be a, a pretty uh, a strong positive correlation there. Um, but it turns out when you do the prediction exercise, the only things that matter uh, have to do with the seeds themselves. And in particular, we can measure how successful they've been in the past. So you have a record of you know, things that they've introduced previously. And just by predicting that the next thing that you tweet is going to be about as successful as the average of the things that you've tweeted previously, you can get a fair way with that. If you then throw in how many followers you have, that helps a little bit more. And really, nothing else matters. So it doesn't really matter how active you are. It doesn't really matter how long you've been on Twitter for. Uh, how many people you're following, so how you know, involved you are in, in what other people are saying. Uh, it also doesn't really help uh, to add in the content uh, features, which is really a surprise. Um, uh, I should say this was before we had uh, lists. So it's possible now that you can classify users more uh, accurately. There may be some interaction terms. But my guess is they're going to help you know, a little bit, but not very much. Uh, so you can see on the right-hand side, this is the x-axis is what we predict. The right, the y-axis is what uh, it, well, actually these are logged uh, uh, values, um, and uh, and the y-axis is what we observe. And you can see that it's a pretty well calibrated prediction that the dots, uh, on average, go along the line, but uh, there's a lot of scatter in there. So the you know, we can explain about a third of the variance. And then this is sort of a very consistent result that we find over and over again when we do prediction exercises that, um, you know, no matter how many features you throw into your model, you sort of get to an R squared of around about a third and then you sort of run out of steam, right? So there's always a lot of unexplained variance, which doesn't mean that it's useless. You know, an R squared of a third can be extremely useful if you can place lots of bets. So if you're a high-frequency trader, you would die to have an R squared of a third. I mean, that would be amazing. Or if you're trying to explain, you know, heritability of, of you know, uh, genetic traits, like that is huge for, for genetics. So, so, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, what is a big R squared depends a lot on the context. But when you think, when we talk about prediction, we often want the next viral video. We want one thing to succeed. And that really requires an R squared of one. Right? That's like Halley's Comet style prediction. And that, I think, is well out of scope for anything to do with the social world. Uh, again, if we look at these influences, we, you know, a lot of the excitement about influences is that they weren't the people who you might have thought of. Right? They weren't the Justin Biebers. They weren't the Barack Obamas. They, they weren't the you know, chieftains of industry. They were these ordinary people in your... Uh, in your, uh, in, your, in your local neighborhoods and social networks, and yet somehow magically they had the impact uh, of the people, uh, of the, the sort of high profile public figures. And that was really, uh, at least uh, from you know, the last you know, 10 or 15 years after uh, the, work, the, 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 the tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell's popularization of all of this was published, that was the message that got through to the marketing world, was you can get you know, Oprah style, you know, uh, returns for, you know, East Village hipster investment, right? So that turns out not to be true. That the influencers are precisely the people that you would have thought of all along, right? They are, in fact, Oprah Winfrey and, you know, Barack Obama and nowadays Justin Bieber. This is a few years ago, so it's, it's out of date. Um, but all those, uh, the people who can actually 
generate influence, at least on Twitter, are exactly the people who have all the followers and are famous for a hundred other reasons as well. Which leads us to the most important question of the morning, which is to do with the person that everybody wants to talk about all the time, apparently, uh, and should she be paid uh, $10,000 per tweet? So this is actually a, a very out-of-date number. Uh, back in 2009, when we were doing this research, I read this little story about how Kim Kardashian was being uh, charging $10,000 per tweet to talk about your product. I think now she probably charges a lot more than that. But at the time, we thought, you know, well, that's an interesting hypothesis. You know, she had about a million followers back then. That's a lot of followers. So uh, there's a question, like, is that the right number? Right? I mean, you, you should pay her more than you would pay a random person, right? Uh, but, uh, but maybe not $10,000. So how should we even think about this exercise? Uh, because the people who are the influencers on Twitter know that they're the influencers and they charge accordingly. Uh, so given that you're a marketer or some other kind of change agent and you've got a fixed budget, how should you spend it, right? Should you take, uh, should you go to one of these agencies that represent these celebrities and, uh, and, and get a small number of Kim Kardashians to talk about your, 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 your product or your, your mission or whatever it is that you're trying to tell people about or should you instead recruit a large number of people who are relatively ordinary, uh, who are less influential, but also much cheaper, right? Possibly even free. Maybe they would just do it because they think it's interesting, okay? Uh, or should you do something in between? So we couldn't actually run this experiment. We would love to run this for real. Um, but what we did was a thought experiment where we constructed some imaginary cost function well, you have a, a component, there's sort of fixed costs, and these are the, your, the wages that you have to pay to your, your marketing people. And then you have a per influencer cost, which, is, uh, that, which is, is scales linearly with the number of followers that they have. And so the ratio of these two costs tells you what your strategy should be. And so what this curve tells you is that when your fixed costs are really high relative to the per influencer cost, uh, you're on the bottom line down here. And so the peak the maximum of the bottom line is the far right hand side. So that means that that's when you should go after the Kim Kardashians, right? When you can only, uh, when it's very, very expensive to go and find influencers to begin with, uh, then you really want to just get a couple of them and you just pay whatever they, uh, whatever they want. But for every other case, uh, we found either an interior maximum or even a maximum at the far left, which means the very least influential people on Twitter. So there's millions and millions of people out there who just have a few, a handful of followers. They generate very little influence, but they generate non-zero influence, right? And if they're very cheap and there's a lot of them, it's actually more cost-effective to target the ordinary influences, as we call them, than uh, these, um, uh, than, than the celebrities. And so I, I don't want to make too strong of a claim about this because we haven't done the actual experiment and presumably the actual result depends on lots of other things that uh, will be contextual. Uh, but this is, I think, the way to think about the problem, right? Is that there's not some magic type of influencer out there and if you can just find them, they'll make your thing go viral. But there's just a, a, a very sort of uh, uh, a straightforward uh, optimization exercise that you have to carry out. So what are the lessons here? Uh, you know, social contagion is really dominated by small events, not by large events. Uh, the, you know, 99% of diffusion terminates within one step of where it's introduced. This seems to be a pretty robust uh, feature of the world. Uh, and this changes the way you think about diffusion. Uh, even when you do see these very rare, very rare, very large events, they're not necessarily viral in the way that we imagine Ebola to be viral. Uh, and there's a very simple reason for that, which is the media, right? <laughs> the, the, we, we got, I think, as researchers, we got very uh, enamored with this idea of social networks and word of mouth uh, influence and, and diffusion through networks. And we forgot that the New York Times and CNN and everything else never really went away, not to mention celebrities, uh, and that they have uh, a tremendous impact on what people know about. And they also intervene in anything that's happening, right? Nothing can really... Uh, become, you know, Gangnam Style can't spread very far before the Today Show wants to interview Tsai, right? And now the media is involved, right? So they're, and they're involved because they're looking for stuff that's interesting constantly. So there's this 
the media are out there digging around trying to find things that are spreading and then they necessarily amplify that. So you can't really study these processes separately and I think that explains a lot of what we see uh, when we look at, at these large events. Uh, you can certainly um, uh, amplify your uh, message by going after, by utilizing these high degree nodes, but these high degree nodes are also very expensive, so it's not necessarily a good idea to do that. Uh, and instead, you can target many, many seeds, right? So this is a, a sort of relatively novel strategy that also is not something you can do in the disease world, but you can do it in a media world, something we call big seed marketing, where instead of trying to start off with an individual seed and get things to spread from there, you start off with a million seeds or 10 million seeds, which you get through conventional uh, advertising or marketing strategies, and then each one of those generates a little bit of, of earned media on top of your paid media, and if that's just, you know, the difference between going from one retweet to two retweets, that's actually a 100% gain uh, in, your, uh, in your earned media. So that's, you know, it's not a 100,000% gain, but it's, you know, 100% is still pretty good. And in fact, you know, much of the time, I think it's going to be more like 20%. Uh, but that's still good news, right? So I think that, you know, if you can take one thing away from today, this idea of, you know, social change happening through social epidemics and that we can engineer social epidemics by finding the influences, you know, that is just a fantasy, right? It's a really lovely, entertaining story. It just doesn't happen. And if it does happen, it's so random and unpredictable that there's no way you can engineer it. So forget that as a model of social change. Uh, you know, there's, there's really... Uh, uh, the, the, the right way to do it is through this much more systematic, realistic uh, assessment of how things spread and how to maximize that given some fixed budget. And I think the, uh, the message really is that there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch, even, even now, even with Twitter, even with influencers. But, you know, if you can get a 20% discount, that's still pretty good. So thank you very much. Do we have any time for questions? Uh, the results you showed up seem to be a lot for Twitter, where you have a structure of followers and leaders, or whatever you may call them. How about a system like YouTube, where it's more flat? Would they hold? It's a great question. I, um, you know, I mean, the, the reason we study Twitter is because Twitter exists, and we have the data. It's a little bit of the, you know, the lamppost problem that you're, you're looking around where the light is. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons why you might think Twitter is special and that if you go look at other, uh, other you know, online, uh, you know, other, like so Facebook may be different. Um, uh, certainly if you think about offline diffusion, that might be different. Uh, you know, the motivation for the first study was to try to, to look at a, you know, what, Twitter was just one of six examples in the first study. Uh, and so the, the similarity across domains there, I think, is encouraging. Uh, we also have some sort of uh, informal information from our colleagues at Facebook that they see much the same thing uh, on Facebook as well. So I think there's sort of some growing evidence that, that this sort of pattern is, uh, uh, is uh, somewhat general uh, online, um, although I think more work needs to be done to establish that. And then we go offline. It's much more speculative, but uh, I think the, I think the really, I don't know what's going to happen to this result, uh, but you know I think that if you if you if you, I mean the nice thing about Twitter is like everything is there, right? All the media is there, all the celebrities are there, all the ordinary people are there, like everyone is there, uh, and so you can measure it all at once. So if you imagine, uh, instead of Twitter, the media ecosystem. And you imagine, you know, how do we find out about things? Sometimes we find out about it from our friends. Sometimes we find out about it from a newspaper. Sometimes we find out about it from reading the television. If you could imagine instrumenting all of that in a common way, you would have something that looked a little bit like the follower graph of Twitter, right? That it would be, it would be very scale-free. Um, and so I, I would speculate that we would see somewhat similar patterns if we could sort of, we had a magic instrument that could measure how everybody got their information. Um, I'm not sure how to, to build that magic instrument. So, uh, so you know, I, I think it's, 
that's a that's a that's definitely uh, at the frontiers of, of what we would like to do. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you said that slide where your model it didn't really matter if the content was interesting or it didn't really matter if it was a specific topic. Yeah. But if it ever gets to a certain point where celebrities are just tweeting things that are uninteresting because they're paid to do it, is that ever going to become part of it? Because it also seems like part of the reason that something goes viral is because it's like a connection to that person yeah. and it's authentic. But once everyone gets wind to the fact that they're just being paid to tweet, won't they lose some of their influence? Uh, yeah, it's a, that's a really interesting uh, question. And uh, the answer is probably, right? Uh, you know, I think that you know, one of the things that makes social science hard uh, is that it's, a, it's an intrinsically moving target. You know, ants don't care that you're looking at them, right? If you understand how ant colonies work, they just keep on keeping on, you know? They don't sort of, it doesn't uh, bother them. But if you understand how people work, they change, right? They respond to the knowledge that you know something about them. So, you know, there's sort of an, an intrinsic kind of arms race going on between marketers and their audiences where the marketers are trying to sort of leverage some sort of marginal, uh, uh, you know, asymmetry in knowledge about, you know, human psychology to, uh, to uh, get you to buy more of their stuff. And then people sort of wise up and say, oh, I'm, I'm now suspicious of that form of information as well. I mean, I think, you know, people were much less suspicious of advertising, you know, sort of 80 years ago, right? Uh, and, and marketing, and, uh, and now we sort of have this intrinsic, uh, uh, you know, uh, barriers that we put up when, when we're confronted with what we see is labeled as marketing. And, and probably that will happen with social media as well, that we'll just sort of, we'll just assume that like everything that Katy Perry says might be sponsoring something. Uh, uh, and so, you know, maybe her credibility will, will be reduced. So uh, it's an interesting question, like how that will, will play out. I'm sure that marketers are going to do it, and I'm sure that people are going to react to it and then we'll find some new equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, would you say that things go viral when there are uh, multiple broadcasts within the same community? Like, uh, for example, if there are multiple broadcasts about the same tweet, would you say that the re that is the reason why things go viral? Multiple broadcasts about the same tweet? Yes, about the same tweet in a community. The same piece of content or? Yeah. Well, so we certainly, I'm not sure this is your question, but we certainly, for a given piece of content, uh, popular content, we often see it uh, entering the system many, many times, right? Uh, and we see about as much heterogeneity in, in cascade size for exactly the same piece of content over its sort of all of the instances in which it's introduced as we do across content itself, right? So, so. So that's sort of like you can run the, con the experiment right, where you control for the content. This is why I think that adding content doesn't really help with prediction because we know that the exact same piece of content, you know, you introduce it a hundred different times, most of the time it won't spread and then once it will, it will spread like a viral, like a viral object. So, so, uh, so we can look at that. I'm not sure if that was your question. Uh, no, I was talking about if, if you look at a community structure, yeah. if there are multiple broadcasts, would you say that's a reason for uh, tweets to go viral? So that you have to hear something multiple times? Yeah. Uh, um, no, I don't think that's really what's going on. I think that, that really what's going on is that uh, is there's two sort of competing forces. One is a competition for attention, that basically any given piece of information is extremely unlikely to be noticed, right? There's so much streaming over your feed or so much passing by you every day that most things you don't hear about. Uh, and so everything just dies out super fast. Uh, and the only thing that can compete with that is these huge hubs that blast them out to so many people that even though the probability that any one uh, view will get retweeted, the, 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 uh, you know, the multiplier is so big that um, uh, the, you know, the numerator is so big that, um, uh, that you get a, a, a large number of, of retweets. So that, I think, is what's going on. And we have you know, very, very simple models that, uh, that can get most of the features that we see from those two, those two forces. Yeah. Thank you. Word to you, Ilan. Word to the next to last question. OK. Maybe the last. 
Yes. Uh, oftentimes I feel like when we discuss the difference between what we would consider like traditional broadcast spread and viral spread of a particular piece of content, especially in the communication field and like new media, that there's a pretty strong connotation that broadcast is older, more centralizing of power, and that like viral spread is more natural and populist and sort of a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, have you found, so like you're not, right, as you move towards prediction, you're not just trying to describe things, you're trying to predict and maybe even work towards things. Do you find that either personally or in the field that you operate in that viral spread is seen as a good, desirable thing? Like is it something that we want to have there be more of? Is it seen as a positive? Uh, I don't think it really breaks down, uh, it breaks sort of either way, right? That there are, I think it's, uh, you know, that there are, uh, there are lots of reasons why you might trust the New York Times, right? Uh, over something that, you, you know, some, some sort of, uh, something that's, that's, that's spreading uh, virally, that they, you know, you sort of believe that they invest a lot of resources in verification and fact-checking, uh, that they have sort of ethical uh, procedures for deciding what to publish and what not to publish, and, uh, you know, they're in contact with government agencies and other kinds of sources of authority. So, so I, I think that there's a lot of good in the broadcast model, but there's also, you know, you might, you might, people have very strong opinions about the New York Times and about you know, they, some people think it's a, you know, liberal conspiracy and other people think Fox News is a conservative conspiracy and so you may, depending on your, on your political beliefs, have active mistrust of, of information that comes from one of these broadcast media. And so maybe you think that, that, that things that you hear through word of mouth are, are more trustworthy. Um, I don't, uh, but then, you know, then you get examples like the Boston uh, Marathon bombings where, you know, the wrong people were, were sort of apprehended by the, the Twitter sphere and, and then that had to be debunked and, and, you know, places like Reddit and were very sort of uh, shamefaced about their role in that. So uh, I think it's a really interesting question, uh, like where does trust reside? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I do think that whatever is going to happen, it's going to be this hybrid form, that the, the mass media isn't going away. It might, you know, the, the, the playing field may shift and new, new, new entities come along that, uh, you know, six years ago, BuzzFeed didn't exist. Now it's got, you know, over 100 million unique views a month. Like, that's a force to be reckoned with in the, in the media world. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still a hub in one of these networks, right? Uh, so. Uh, I do think it's interesting that uh, that in the celebrity, you know, we've always been interested in what celebrities are doing, but in the past, they were always intermediated by the media, right? And so I think one really interesting thing is happening on Twitter is the disintermediation of uh, of celebrities from their audiences that they now can speak directly, uh, and that's uh, you know also sort of shifting the balance of power. But just because the balance of power is shifting between individual entities doesn't mean that the overall pattern is that different. And I think that probably what we're seeing here is in some sense always been happening, right? But we just, it was just invisible to us before because we couldn't measure it. So, uh, so I think as, as potentially biased as Twitter is, it, it is sort of, it does uh, unify under a single platform like an entire ecosystem of of uh, of different types of entities that would were, were all sort of uh, all existed previously, right? Uh, but uh, we're not you couldn't measure their impact in a in a sort of apples to apples way like you can on Twitter. So to me, that's the most interesting thing about Twitter. But I said I'll have to think more about the where does trust lie. I think that's a good question. So Thank I'm going to seize the opportunity for the last question. You uh, mentioned Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, you talked about influencers. Uh, your work has been described, well, there was a, a headline someone wrote saying, is the tipping point toast? And so I'm just wondering if you could tell us about, anecdotally, your relationship with the people that the tipping point created or with Malcolm Gladwell has there been a pushback? Where does that stand? Well, the sales of the tipping point were certainly not toast. <laughs> uh, 
after that, you know, that was six years ago when that article was written. Um, uh, I think, you know, the message that I get out of this is people love stories, right? That this is sort of, it is the oldest form of explanation. It is possibly the only form of explanation that comes naturally to us. You know, you have to learn statistics. You have to learn, uh, uh, you know, you have to learn experimental methods. Uh, you know, you have to learn other more sophisticated forms of explanation. You have to learn mathematical models. Uh, but stories, I mean, you learn stories too, but you learn them as a baby, right? And so by the time you, you know, reach adulthood, that it is the sort of built-in mechanism for explaining cause and effect. Uh, and it's so compelling to us that we, we, we love everything that is a good story. And even after someone explains to you all the problems there are with that story, you still think, yeah, but it's a really good story. I really like that one about the, you know, the salesman with all the friends or the, the woman who ran the book club. Like, that's kind of awesome. Um, and then someone comes along and says, no, 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 there's these mathematical models and blah, blah, blah. And you think, ah, that's just boring and difficult. And I really want to just read stories. And so I think as social scientists, we're really sort of fighting at a competitive disadvantage uh, because we don't have as good stories because the good stories are, are wrong. Right? I mean, they're misleading. Like the, the reality is, I mean, reality has no obligation to be interesting, right? You know, that the, 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 a boring explanation is just as likely to be right as an interesting explanation. But an interesting explanation is much more likely to be believed, right? And there were, you know, psychologists do experiments where they, they expose people to explanations that have the same information content uh, but different uh, uh, interestingness, right? Different forms. And the interesting, engaging form always generates more confidence uh, in the listeners in their in their beliefs about their understanding than than uh, than the than the uninteresting form. So, uh, and then of course you can manipulate that so that you can make the information content of the interesting story actually less than the uninteresting story in the pattern holds. So, so I think that you know my beef is not really with Malcolm Gladwell personally. He just happens to be an extraordinarily good storyteller, and so he's been immensely successful in, in getting people to listen to his stories. Um, but I think that it's incredibly damaging for our understanding of the world to, you know, and I've spent, you know, the last decade or so trying to deprogram everyone who read The Tipping Point, right, which is impossible because there's millions of people who have read it. And even today, people still say, well, you know, it's, we know how to do this, really. It's just about finding the influences. And I think, well, you actually have no idea what that statement even means, right, let alone are you able to do it. So, so I think, you know, but at the end of the day, I have no other recourse than to just sort of keep trying to explain things over and over again. Uh, and, you know, I think that's something that we can do as social scientists and as public intellectuals to try to sort of help nudge people, uh, maybe even just people in positions to make decisions to think more scientifically about the world and about evidence uh, and to be less uh, swayed by stories, although but it's always going to be an uphill battle because they're so powerful. I noticed that you didn't say a viral tweet would be the answer to Malcolm right. Gladwell. Right um, for those of you who are interested and available in room 201 at 4 o'clock, there is a chance to engage in further conversation with Duncan. And uh, you, met, you closed on the interesting versus science, story versus science. Uh, I would like all of you to join me in please letting Duncan know that he was amazingly interesting.